Okay, Marcia. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 9th of December 2021. So unfortunately, Hadi could not make it today, and that's why I'm here. So my name is Marcia Bone. I'm a colleague of Hadi at TU Delft, and together with Sebastian Geiger from Harriet Watts, I have the pleasure to co-host today's webinar. So we are delighted to host Andreas Busch from Harriet Watt University as our distinguished speaker. So Andreas Busch is a professor in earth sciences, focusing mainly on geoenergy applications. He is the head of the geoenergy research group in the Lyle Center at Harriet Watt University. The group is composed of geologists, geomechanists, petroleum engineers, hydrologists and geochemists, aiming at an improved understanding of the coupled thermo, hydro, chemical, mechanical aspects related to carbon and capture and storage, geothermal heat and natural gas production on the laboratory, field and modeled reservoir scale. Prior to joining Harriet Watt, Andreas worked in Shell's research department in the Netherlands. He has a postdoctoral degree, a PhD and master in geology and a bachelor with honors in economic sedimentology. So thank you, Andreas, for graciously accepting our invitation. And to the audience, please note that this lecture will last for about 30 minutes, followed by questions. And please type your questions in the chat box and Sebastian will take them after the lecture. So please do not wait till the end of the lecture to post your questions, but just type them whenever you feel appropriate as they may trigger other questions by other participants. So Andreas, thank you very much for being here and we're all looking forward to hearing your lecture. So please start. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Marty and, and Sebastian. And um, Hadi is somewhere, hopefully on holidays, uh, he is. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great honor to uh, also present in this webinar series, which I think is, uh, is a fantastic thing that uh, Hadi and Sebastian put together. And it's great to um, be one of those fantastic speakers that I'm typically watching while I'm cooking. That's that's the, the great thing of having YouTube. You can just watch it whenever you feel like. And uh, for me, it's it's cooking. So then I, I get some food and some great entertainment. So um, thanks for being here. Um, what I will present today is a bit about leakage from subsurface storage reservoirs. How much do we need to care? And especially, what do we need to care about? Um, let's first have a look at um, this fantastic little schematic uh, that uh, some of my PhD students put together. Really nice, brand new, uh, which shows a bit um, the different uh, things that we need to look at when storing uh, fluids in the deeper subsurface. So especially when we are pressurizing the deeper subsurface, so we are looking into um, uh, potential fault activation by, by increasing pressures above uh, hydrostatic. We might look into fault flow, fractures. We might look into capillary leakage, these sort of things. And uh, obviously, this is all very difficult um, risks to look at because we, uh, we, we mainly need to look at them from a, from a laboratory perspective. And uh, as you all know, um, some of these mechanisms simply take much, much longer than whatever we can reproduce in the laboratory. And uh, often, probably under real subsurface conditions, things might look just different. So when we are pressurizing the, the deeper subsurface, so we need to look at uh, the containment, so especially the cap rocks, uh, the primary cap rock. But then, of course, also when we, when we are looking into um, uh, a storage system, then we also need to look at secondary seals that could be part of the storage complex. So it's not necessarily only a single cap rock. It might also be multiple stacked cap rocks or seals that, that form part of the storage complex. That's quite important to keep in mind. Um, fault reactivation I mentioned. Um, we are, of course, pressurizing the reservoir. <coughs> We pressurize the reservoir, that might lead to reservoir deformation, which is um, uh, something we might see at the surface because we get surface movement. This is not only when we are pressurizing uh, hydrostatic reservoirs like saline aquifers, but also when we are repressurizing depleted reservoirs like oil and gas reservoirs, we might see some changes on the surface on probably micrometer to millimeter scale, something that we can measure using uh, GIS or, or, or 
satellite data, for instance. Uh, pressurizing um, the reservoir requires a, a proper monitoring program, of course. We want to know the changes in pressure, temperatures, saturations, and these sort of things. And of course, we need to have a look at uh, reservoir compartmentalization. So fault could very well comp compartmentalize a reservoir, which then gives some strange pressure response during injection because our pressurized volume might simply be smaller than anticipated. So that is that is important to keep in mind. Um, the overburden also has some, um, uh, um, you know, um, what do you say? We, we need to consider um, the overburden for operational guidance. So um, the maximum injection pressure, of course, before the overburden might start leaking is important to know. That also gives us some constraints on the maximum amount of gas we can inject into a reservoir in terms of the uh, gas column height. And uh, we also need to look at uh, the hydraulic fracture propagation once we exceed the fracturing pressure or the fracture reopening pressure. And finally, of course, the wells, probably um, the most risky part in injecting fluids in the deeper subsurface, but it, it's of course also the, the best controlled part because this is where we can place instruments to actually look at pressure, temperature, saturation changes and these sort of things, or acoustic emissions, what have you. Um, but we need to keep in mind that, uh, or we need to, to carefully consider where to locate the wells and how to design the wells and look at the life cycle, well integrity. If we leave the wells aside, uh, more or less, um, we know that there is a potential risk of well bore leakage. Uh, so that isn't a really small risk, that, 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 that can be a larger risk. It really depends on the wells, especially legacy wells, or old wells drilled, for instance, into hydrocarbon reservoirs. But if you're now looking at the geological risks for, for carbon or hydrogen leakage, then of course we, we first start with uh, capillary and diffusive leakage. Diffusive leakage will always happen. Capillary leakage will only happen if we are increasing, exceeding the capillary entry pressure. And I'll get back to this in a minute. Um, of course, we might leak along faults. Faults might you know, be continuous to the surface, or they might just you know end somewhere in the deeper subsurface. They might or might not uh, cross cut the cap rock, and they might or might not be leaking. Uh, so that, that all is, is relatively difficult to assess as uh, to begin with. I mean, we need to know if there's a fault or if there's no fault. And of course, we can only see those faults that are observable in seismic data. So relatively difficult to begin with. Uh, in case there would be fault leakage, um, you know, above probably most of the cap box, there's always a shallow aquifer. And uh, that means uh, a formation with higher permeability and porosity. And um, that might take up a lot of the leaking fluids through dissolution, dissipation. We have the hydrodynamics of these aquifers, so they might carry a lot of the leaking fluids away and still trap them so that they never get back to the surface. But if they do, obviously we have uh, different scenarios of how fluids can get back to the surface and contaminate uh, uh, hydrosphere, biosphere, atmosphere could be by a point source or it could be diffusive. If it's a point source, it might be relatively easy to detect. If it's diffusive over a really large area, then it might not be easy to detect and we might stay below baseline monitoring levels. And finally, of course, that is not directly fluid leakage and use seismicity is, is a big topic. Um, <clears throat> and also needs to be carefully considered for the cases where we have faults. Let's have a brief look at uh, capillary leakage. I'm, I'm sure most of you know how that works. Um, so typically when we are injecting fluids uh, in, uh, underneath an anticline, we start filling the top of the anticline with uh, CO2, maybe with hydrogen, whatever. Uh, natural gas reservoirs typically have that as well. And um, um, you know, every gas column height exerts a certain pressure on the capwalk reservoir interface, as you see here on the picture on the right. And if we are exceeding a certain um, uh, gas column height, which equates to a certain capillary pressure, we might uh, get leakage, capillary leakage across the capwalk. 
This is something we can calculate. Um, so, I mean, we get an interplay between buoyancy pressure and uh, capillary pressure. If the buoyancy pressure is higher than the capillary pressure, then we get leakage if both are the same. This is our maximum gas column height, which kind of relates to the maximum amount of gas we can inject into the reservoir before capillary leakage would occur. Um, I can tell you I did some of these experiments myself in the laboratory. There's, there's many other people who did that, but there actually isn't. There's only like a, really a few papers. You need to be very patient to actually be able to determine the capillary breakthrough pressure. And this picture here gives you a bit of a summary of the data um, that, that uh, has been published in the literature. Typically, so this is uh, showing capillary breakthrough pressure as a function of brine permeability. Both are related. Uh, the bottom x-axis is in square meter, which I like. The top x-axis is in millidarcy, which is more oil field units. Typically, cap rocks above storage reservoirs are in the order of maybe 10 to the minus 19 to 10 to the minus 21, 22 square meters. Uh, this is the sort of permeability. So this is our nano darcy. And um, this relates to CO2 column heights of about 300 to 3,000 meters with capillary entry pressures of 1 to 10 MPA under realistic subsurface conditions for CO2 storage in this case. So this is, this is quite a lot. So we really need to inject a lot of gas before we start leaking. Um, in case it is leaking, Assume that case, assume we are exceeding capillary entry pressure, then we are getting advective flow uh, across the cap lock, cap lock with a capillary network. And that flow is um, controlled, um, of course, by the uh, transport porosity. Typically, uh, the transport porosity is very, very low because we are not uh, desaturating the cap rock quite significantly. There have been some calculations uh, assuming that the transport porosity is, is, is just like uh, a, a very small, so 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 of the total porosity of the cap rock. And that gives you an idea of what the, uh, the gas permeabilities across the cap rock could be. Uh, in any case, it is it is a suitable leakage mechanism in natural uh, oil and gas reservoirs, but over much, much longer time scales than what we are looking at for our engineered reservoirs. So these are the things that are happening over hundreds to uh, thousands to millions of years. And of course, we know also from natural systems that good cap rocks can hold gas columns of hundreds of meters. I think the largest one that I've seen is, is more in the order of, of more than a thousand of meters. So um, we kind of did some calculations um, <clears throat> for the time that is required to bypass a cap rock of different thicknesses. And uh, you see here the, 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 the black lines. These are our effective gas permeabilities, uh, kind of even included the worst case scenario, micro Darcy, while more realistic is uh, nano Darcy to sub nano Darcy. Um, uh, effective permeability to gas as a function of cap rock thickness. You see cap rock thickness from 10, 100, and 1,000 meters. So typically we are on the order of hundreds of meters of cap rock thickness. And if we are um, in the order of nano Darcy for gas permeability, then we are really on the order of thousands to maybe even 10,000s of years that is required to bypass a cap rock following capillary leakage. Well, um, the other one I mentioned before is diffusive leakage. Um, there have been a couple of papers stating that by diffusion, uh, cap rocks could corrode that much that the permeability would significantly increase. Um, I wonder if that is really the case. I mean, we know that uh, natural gas reservoirs can leak by diffusion, but we also know, and that has been calculated, that this is on the order of hundreds of millions of years, right? In any case, um, diffusion, so that is CO2 or maybe hydrogen diffusion through the uh, aqueous phase, water saturated, is something that will always happen because we will always have a concentration gradient. But it is slow. It is, it is really, really slow. Um, on the basin scale, um, it, of course, controls a lot of our regional diagenesis. Uh, it, it might be an important transport mechanism also for hydrocarbon migration. Uh, source rock potential is, is controlled by diffusion and so on and so forth. 
uh, but the, the transport capacity is very low, although it's permanent and ubiquitous. So we also did a calculation here to look at the, the different more realistic diffusion coefficients that we find in uh, from lab experiments. So those are on the order of 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 12 square meters a second. And here you again, you, you have plotted um, the time as a function of catwalk. If we are on the order of 100, say 100 meters of, um, of catwalk thickness and um, diffusion coefficient of, I mean, that would only be aqueous, right? Tortuosity of one is 10 to the minus nine. We would already have 100,000 years until that gas would actually really cross the cap of 100 meters. Keep in mind that the y-axis is in millions of years. So certainly completely irrelevant, irrelevant as a leakage mechanism. Yet um, all these measurements are extremely difficult and time consuming to do. And I know that because I did many of them uh, as part of my PhD a long time ago, maybe even postdoc. So uh, a, lot, a lot goes wrong. You need to be very patient and then, you know, the, the experiment fails and you need to do it again after you waited for a couple of weeks. So all really, really difficult. Even a single um, permeability of, of, a, of a shale is extremely difficult to determine. And uh, at the moment, I have PhD students in the labs that are doing that. Uh, I can imagine that it's sometimes frustrating if you're not really getting the information out of the experiment that you're aiming for. So um, we started playing a bit um, with Newton scattering. So this is uh, really by going to the big uh, nuclear research centers. There's one in Germany where we typically went to. And uh, we are using um, a Newton beam to shoot on samples, uh, samples of sizes of you know, a centimeter or two with a thickness of a quarter of a millimeter, something like that. So quite representative for Maddo. And we are analyzing uh, the pore size range of that Maddo. It actually is pretty much the only method Maybe one of the very no, it's actually I think the only method that can really determine the pore size distribution of a mud rock from smallest to biggest pore. So from nanometer to micrometer. And this is pretty much what we need. And this is something you see on the lower left hand side. So we see intensity, which kind of relates to the amount of pores that we find as a function of a scattering vector, which we can recalculate to pore size, which you see on the top x axis. Right, the smaller the pores, the more we have. If we plot that on a log log scale, we pretty much get a straight line. So, uh, uh, um, a log log, a linear log log relationship. What we did with that data is um, developed a new MATLAB based uh, code that is called MATSAS uh, to do data interpretation. So, we use all the data and we come up with um, uh, information on specific surface area, porosity, pore size distribution, and fractal dimensions. This is actually work that is or has been done by Amir Saman Resayan. And uh, he used that data and information to uh, come up with fractal models to predict effective diffusion coefficients and permeabilities. You see the equations in here. Please. Please, by all means, send me someone an email to ask about details or have a look at the paper. This has recently been published in Transport and Pause Media. And uh, Amir Saman can, can explain me much better of uh, how these equations came together. And I should also mention, if you're lucky, I could still see a window for uh, Amir Saman accepting postdocs offers, but I uh, sent him an email and, and asked him about that. So um, what you did with the equations was basically um, calculating different permeabilities and diffusion coefficients for, I think, almost 80 or 90 mud rocks that come from, I think, 10 or 15 mud rock groups. So we looked at all sorts of organic rich, organic lean, so some of the cap rock from CO2 storage reservoirs, some from nuclear waste repositories, some from the shale gas reservoirs in the US and elsewhere. And uh, this is the output. So you see permeability as a function of porosity um, on the left-hand side for different permeabilities. So um, 
we see continuous flow. This is the, the lower uh, curve. We see um, uh, slip flow permeability. And what we also see is experiments done on the very same sample. So these are the, the bigger symbols that you see here, the, the little squares or the bigger crosses for comparison. And what you see is that uh, the predictions are actually quite good to match the actual experiment. Um, and that gives us some more opportunities to actually predict permeability or different terms of permeability, slip flow, Darcy's flow, uh, when only looking at the pore size distribution of these sort of samples, which is still much easier to determine than the actual permeability in the laboratory. On the right-hand side, you see similar information on uh, effective diffusion coefficient. Effective diffusion coefficient from the laboratory is more than difficult, really. And uh, what you also see here is the predictions, that's the black curve, and again, these open symbols that you see, these are um, the laboratory experiments that have been done, I think, either at Aachen University or at uh, SKCN in Belgium. And again, you see that within, I don't know, a third or half of an order of magnitude, we actually get quite a good prediction. Right. Um, the next thing we are studying, which is, of course, very important uh, to determine leakage, is fault. Again, um, the picture from the beginning, and if you zoom in, in a little bit into that big red dot that you see here, then uh, you see a, a nice schematic of a fault zone um, that is after Kappa and Rotquist. Um, very, very nice one. I, I used it a lot in my lectures, so th th thanks for for, for for publishing that and thanks to Tom Phillips for reworking that a bit. Um, so what you see is first of all the, uh, the red line in the middle which is our fault core. So this is uh, where we have most of the friction. This is where we are uh, grinding our material to the smallest particle sizes. So this is uh, typically an area that is more or less impermeable especially for uh, lateral flow. And then left and right of the fault core, we have the damage zone. The damage zone is an area of high fracturing. Uh, fracturing is, or fracture density is higher, closer to the fault core, and is then, you know, decreasing, the density is decreasing towards um, uh, the protolith, which is our house rock, and which then only contains the natural fractures that have been there uh, before um, faulting. Right, so I mean, the task here obviously is um, what are the fluid flow rates along such a structure? And you see how complex that structure is. Uh, nothing is linear, uh, all, all is uh, connected or disconnected. Some have a high density, some parts have a high density of fracture, some have a low one. We don't know if, if a single fracture is actually sealing or non sealing, and so on and so forth. So what we did a um, couple of years ago is uh, to come up with a relatively large research program, the DETECT project that was funded by um, the uh, ACT program. So that, that is money coming from the EU plus uh, national governments. And uh, we wanted to see if we can actually upscale um, fracture flow via um, default flow towards the reservoir leakage. So for that, um, we came up with a couple of work packages. Um, all are important, but I will only focus on some of the work that we have done. Uh, one of the important ones is, of course, to look at uh, fracture flow along a specific fracture, so single fracture flow with different roughness and different tortuosity. And all this is a function of changes in poor pressure. Right? And changes in poor pressure, of course, relates to changes in effective stress. Um, we then use the information from the single fracture permeability experiments and try to feed them into uh, upscale fracture network models that then uh, produce the single permeability output from the fracture networks. And those outputs were then uh, included into reservoir models where we could, for instance, predict the leakage across uh, uh, a fault zone, let's say, in the North Sea. So we mainly focus on the North Sea. <clears throat> and you can then study how long it takes um, for a certain amount of, of fluids to leak across a cap rock. Right. Um, let's have a bit of a closer look at all this. 
mentioned before that we um, looked at uh, the single factor permeability as a function of changes in pore pressure or, or effective stress. Um, we developed uh, a, a new permeometer to actually do that, to, to go from very high permeability to really low permeability. Sometimes difficult with, with permeometers, they can either do the one or the other. Um, so we have now one that, that can do all of them. And uh, what you see on the big picture in the middle is um, all the data that we produced or the data <clears throat> that has been published previously. And uh, the first thing you see on the y-axis is this broad range in permeability. <clears throat> this is core permeability. And while um, perme matrix permeability of, of mud rocks maybe ranges from uh, 10 to the 18 to 10 to the minus 21 or something square meter, then we find for, for fracture permeability, we find a range from 10 to the minus 13 to 10 to the minus 21, so which is probably a three to four times a bigger range, and that, that is quite significant. What we also see is when we are looking at the specific data is that we kind of get two different sets of data, and the one is with the high permeability, minus 13 to minus 16, and these are typically the brittle of a stiff box with a high Young's modulus, and we see um, the data of 10 to the minus, say, 17 down to 10 to the minus 21. And these are typically the one, the, the samples that are very ductile plastic with very low Young's modulus. So it's these two groups. If you compare the fracture permeability of the ductile samples, we also find that that permeability is actually very close to the matrix permeability, which means that uh, these sort of rocks would be self-sealing and you wouldn't expect any leakage. We also looked a bit at um, permeability as a function of effective stress in relation to Young's modulus, and this is something you see here in the middle. And uh, obviously, what I mentioned before, we see um, higher permeabilities for higher Young modulus samples. And this is quite, quite an interesting output. I mean, it is quite intuitive if you think about that. But if you then really use that concept, you can actually apply it to uh, sonic locks uh, that, uh, that are providing Young's modulus data. So if you have sonic locks, if you get the Young's modulus data, you can kind of, you know, first order bit of thumb estimate um, predict the fracture permeability of your ceiling unit if you have that data. And that is quite important because it gives you quite a good handle to get a quick first guesstimate. And this is what we are all after, right? I mean, if you want to predict capoc ceiling integrity, we do not really want to run uh, a, a couple of years of a lab program. Of course, we at university, we like to, but operators might not. Um, another thing we did, and I quickly need to change something here. I realized that I still had some recording in there, which should not have been there. Give me a second. I... Huh. Should actually have been out of it. Right, let's try again. Ah, that's better. So um, we did some research on the fractures and we tried to bring uh, fracture permeability down to one of the key characteristics of fractures and this is its roughness. And uh, you see the roughness here on the right hand side. Um, of course, on the left hand side, you see how a uh, fracture aperture is modeled planar, right, parallel plate model with that uh, relatively simple equation that you see down here, the A cubed over the two nu times the delta P. And on the right hand side, you see how it looks like in reality. So um, it, it, it is not parallel plate, we have a roughness. And of course, depending on the roughness, we get different permeabilities. This is something we tried to reproduce using um, printed models. Sorry for interrupting, um, Andreas. You just you're back on your um, power, regular PowerPoint presentation, not the. Um, ah, here we go. Thanks. I don't know. Apologies. Yeah. No, it's perfect. Okay. Right. Um, so we looked at um, printed samples 
and uh, we printed samples with a different roughness. Right, you see the different roughnesses here on the right hand side. If you have a roughness, say, of 0 0.022 or 2 to 4 or something, uh, you're getting relatively close to your parallel plate model. Right, but if you have more a coarser roughness and you're, you're going to roughnesses of 10 to 12, 12, 14, 14, 16, something like that, you can already see that your roughness I mean, has kind of a tortuosity and um, that it would be relatively difficult difficult to actually close the fracture if you're applying a, a, a high or in that case a low effective stress right um, so this is what something that um, PhD student of mine you see the nice picture in here Tom Phillips looked at in some more details so this was in collaboration with uh, Ghent University with Fale Knudel and Tom Boltrace and uh, they looked at um, uh, permeability of rough fractures, of different rough fractures as, as a function of effective stress. So we see that um, roughnesses, like in this case, at this little inlet, they are somewhere between two and nine. Uh, they do not really change significantly in terms of permeability. Um, but if you're exceeding a roughness and we go to, to a roughness of about 11, we are increasing permeability by uh, uh, by a factor two to three. So that, that really is a bigger jump. And of course, the, the larger the roughness, you could relate roughness to a change in grain size. Uh, roughness can change with a bedding to angle and so on and so forth. But it clearly gives us some indication of how important roughness is in all this. So what we, do we then do with all that data? <clears throat> of course, the data needs to go somewhere. And uh, one of the examples, so we have several examples of all this, and some of these examples are uh, submitted to journal papers or, or just in press. Um, we try to use all the data to kind of predict um, fracture networks. One of the best examples to actually do that is to go to Monterey in Switzerland. That's in the Swiss Jaw Mountains and uh, Swiss Topo, so the Swiss Geological Survey, they are running an underground uh, laboratory there. And you see um, the location of that laboratory down here, so it's in the north um, western part of Switzerland, um, about an hour drive of Bar from, from Basel, and there's a motorway tunnel, and uh, near that motorway tunnel they drilled a couple of uh, side galleries that are nowadays used for research purposes, mainly uh, with regards to uh, radioactive waste storage. The beauty there is um, that um, some of the galleries actually transacted a fault zone. It's a fault zone that sits in between uh, a shale formation. This is the Opalino shale, uh, probably one or the best studied uh, shale material there, there is. And um, we were lucky enough to, to get the, uh, uh, the drawings or the, the, the mapped traces of the individual fracture networks of um, this fault zone. So if you're transacting at the right angle of fault zone once, you're actually getting two windows that are not too far apart, so on left and right hand side of the gallery. Uh, and uh, in this case, this was done four times, so we're actually getting four different windows with four times the information that you see here. So what we did is uh, basically using the mapped traces and uh, digitizing them. That's to be done in a draw drawing software, right? And um, we then used a frag pack that was developed uh, at Aberdeen University by Dave Healy and co-workers to get the statistics of these fracture networks. So this is work that has been done by Roberto Rizzo, who is now at Edinburgh University. So we get things like a trace length and the frequency of that. We get the length and the orientation of everything. Uh, we get the density. We, we get the connectivity that is important of all these fault traces. And we get that in, 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 in nice numbers, so statistically evaluated. And having all that information and, of course, the digital image, and then on top of that, even um, fracture permeability data, we can put that into uh, a fracture network model. And this is something that has been done by uh, Florian Doster's group. So in this case, uh, Raphael March together with us. And uh, what they came up with is, uh, first of all, the contact stresses. So looking at the different 
uh, directions of the individual fractures. Of course, they all have different contact stresses because they all have a different angle to uh, the tectonic stress regime. Uh, that allows us to uh, determine the apertures. And if we have the apertures, we can determine the permeability and can come up with a permeability of the fracture network in 2D. And that is, of course, quite nice because we can then uh, try to make a link to the actual field measurements. And I'm not showing the data in here, uh, but the output of that modeling exercise that was done in MLST uh, is actually showing that the prediction is uh, pretty good in comparison to some um, uh, fault permeability experiments that have been done as a field test. So, but you see, you know, how tricky this entire exercise actually is. It, it took us uh, quite a long time to get to that stage, a couple of years. That's, of course, nothing an operator would wait for. Um, and uh, we need to, to work with analog data. In any case, um, this work has been done really to look at uh, leakage across the primary catwalk. That, that's all nice and dandy, but then, of course, um, what we still don't have any clue about is what is happening above the primary catwalk. So assume we get leakage across the primary catwalk. Um, if that is the only catwalk of our storage complex, then, of course, we officially get leakage, uh, and, and that won't, won't make the operator particularly proud. But then what is happening above the catwalk towards the shallower subsurface, which can still be a kilometer, one and a half kilometer in distance. So I mentioned before that, uh, that the fault can, can run towards the surface, that we can get uh, dissolution, dissipation in shallow aquifers. And uh, I mean, as, as long as CO2, hydrogen, whatever fluid we're injecting is not getting, uh, is not contaminating groundwater, is not contaminating oceans, is not contaminating the atmosphere, the biosphere, then, of course, uh, the risk is, is rather low. So, but we still have very, very little information and knowledge on what is happening really on that large distance between the catwalk and the surface. And I think this is clearly a big, uh, should be a big research focus for the future. So finally, what matters? Um, well, understanding leakage across the primary catwalk is, of course, important as it defines leakage from the storage reservoir. And this is this is um, then this is one of the most important thing we need to learn and understand. We know that we can inject fluids into a reservoir; that there's no doubt about that. But uh, we have much less information on how or if uh, fluids can leak back towards the surface. Um, Maybe my opinion, but I think um, there's more and more people that, that might share that opinion is that matrix leakage seems less of a concern. It's simply the time scales that are too long. Uh, fault leakage seems much more relevant, um, but we also find that individual case studies really require significant work in terms of lab field and modeling work. Um, and um, obviously, um, it, it will certainly stay more in, in the research focus. I mean, the more of these case studies we looked at, uh, the more analog data that we can that uh, we have that we can then actually apply to a specific operational case study. What is happening above the primary catwalk? Probably a lot. Uh, certainly, dissolution, dissipation, accumulation, reaction of leaking CO2, maybe also hydrogen with shallower aquifers and seals. Contamination of the hydrosphere, the biosphere, the atmosphere depends on the weights of fluids getting to the surface. And that is uh, until now rather unquantified. Um, so, but still we need some proof for all this uh, and then that really requires further research. All right, um, I, I should also mention that um, and this is some self, some marketing uh, for ourselves. Um, part of the talk that I was presenting will be part of an online course uh, run by ELGE on CO2 storage. So if, you, if you're keen on more and more about all this, then maybe consider signing up for that ELGE course. Uh, it gives you a full range of uh, CO2 storage by some uh, great people like uh, Eric McKay and Florent Doster, my colleagues at Harold Watt, Martin Landro and Philip Ringrose from MTNU or Equinor. Uh, 
And finally, um, I certainly need to acknowledge uh, all the people that, that had putting these um, PowerPoint slides together, some of uh, my, my PhDs. So Saman, you, you met with already, and Tom Phillips you met, but it's also Georgi, Sarisa, Lukman, and Eric. And then, of course, the uh, excellent Nathaniel and Roberto, uh, who worked in the DTEC project uh, as postdocs. And with that, um, thanks for following this webinar and maybe a bit early, but uh, happy holidays. Thank you. So thank you very much, Andreas. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I saw that there are plenty of questions coming in. So Sebastian, please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you also from my side. Andreas, can you see us fine? Have you, you can probably remove your great accent. So yeah. Plenty of questions. Um, let me start with, thank you for your talk, of course, as well. Let me start with one from Neil Price. Um, it says, within many CCS projects, technical risks are often classified as low probability high risk events. Are we underestimating these risks given that we have uncertain lab and relatively few field measurements? Oof, diff, diff, difficult one. Um... I, I, I don't think we are underestimating the risk of matrix leakage, um, for instance. Um, I think we have still have difficulties estimating the technical risk when it comes to um, uh, fault leakage in particular. Right? It's very difficult um, to get hands-on uh, data that relate to faults. I mean, we sometimes just don't see the faults, right? I mean, we can, we can come up again with a... Uh, a log normal prediction of what the fault density with a certain flow is in the reservoir that we are looking at. But if that is then really the case, we don't know if those faults are leaking. We also don't know. We might know that um, if there's faults, for instance, in, in former hydrocarbon reservoirs, then if they're leaking, then only very, very small. Um, but I think, uh, especially when it comes to faults, um, we, we certainly need more work. I think when it comes to wells and risk of leakage along wells, I think this is much better uh, quantified. And of course, we, we have some good options of uh, reworking a well, for instance, um, in case it is leaking. If a fault is leaking, there's not so much we can do about that, maybe to a control to relief well or something like that. Um, but that, that, that is it. Uh, a well is much easier. So, I mean, there, there is still some, some, some risk, but I think we are, we are getting, we, we are getting much better in really, uh, putting numbers or quantifying these risks, certainly. And this, this has really changed over the past 10 years. And 10 years ago, I think there were a lot of people that thought that matrix leak was actually a concern. Uh, I think these days it's not the case anymore. Yeah, your dog is very excited about your answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry, there was someone at the door. He's then typically freaking out a little. Um, thanks, Andreas. We have a question from Florian, uh, who you and I obviously know very well and just gave a talk a few weeks ago. The two part question, and he says, um, Thanks, Andreas. Looking at the ductile brittle permeability, how, homog how homogeneous are the mud rocks? In terms of brittleness and ductileness, or asked differently, is the uncertainty coming from the stress sensitivity completely masked by geological heterogeneity? Yeah, that's uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I haven't expected anything else from you, Florian. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in fact, we are, we are treating a mud rock as a homogeneous package, right? Uh, we also, I mean, imagine a mud rock has a layering that is typically on the micrometer level. Right, so this is this is something we cannot test in lab experiments where we are drilling plugs that are on the centimeter level. So this is order of magnitude difference. So when we are testing, for instance, the mechanical properties of that mud rock, then uh, we we are already cross cutting many many of these layers that might be more clay, which more silty, and so on and so forth. So we are already getting kind of an average value of the mechanical property of that seal material. But I think um, if you're looking at individual layers, there might, uh, there might be a big range in, in, in stiffness parameters, as a matter of fact, as, as you kind of uh, indicate already. But uh, this, this is almost impossible to really um, take apart. I'm going to follow up with a 
question on myself here and on this geological uncertainty. So we have enough, we spent enough, a lot of money to characterize the reservoir itself to get a handle on geologic uncertainty, how uncertainty can impact flow and storage behaviors. But the overburden and the seals are normally not that well characterized. We don't we don't want to drill wells, for example, core or um, shoot expensive seismics. And I remember studies from Grant Nickel who characterized the formations above Sleipner and they're incredibly, incredibly heterogeneous. So coming back to Florence question, also Neil's question, do we need to do more to understand the risk by actually having specific efforts in characterizing the seal itself and the heterogeneity and the uncertainty in the heterogeneity? Uh, yeah, we, sh we should, but it is it is difficult to begin with. I mean, if you're thinking about reservoir work, um, a, a lot of the work on the reservoirs that we are looking at has been done from outcrops. But the proper sandstone or carbonate might be weathered, uh, but it's, it's very easy to get fresh surfaces to look at heterogeneities and you know to count fractures and all these sort of things. That is something that is uh, very very difficult for mud rocks for instance, because if they're at the surface, they're weathered and, and you, you, you see nothing. This is why we are going to these uh, sort of underground laboratories like the one I showed uh, for uh, in Monterey. Right? There, there we have a, a relatively fresh surface. We can look at that. Uh, we can study that. We can try to understand that. Or you can go to uh, whatever, the north of Norway, uh, where we looked at, at one of the fault zones in Spitsbergen, for instance. Uh, all that is possible, but I think what's really lacking for mud rocks, for the cap rocks, is all that analog data to begin with. So the, the, the you know the armies of students that were sent to outcrops to actually characterize that um, that that isn't happening for mud rocks. And then of course you're right. Um, we are typically calling um, the reservoir. But there's hardly any information or core material for the cap rock. And if there's any, maybe from all cores, from hydrocarbon reservoirs, then that has been totally degraded in, in, in the core store already. So we, we might be able to do some mineralogy, but we cannot certainly not do plug testing on this material. So it's, it's down to the operators to really drill proper core materials in newly developed, say, CO2 uh, storage reservoirs, right? So if, if, if there's a, a new drilling, then of course it's very advisable to, to take also core material from the cap rock. Okay, thank you, Andreas. Um, a number of questions around fractures and fracture modeling. Um, picking one from Kuna Zulek, um, he asks, on slide 16, can we say that the high Young's modulus leading to high permeability is a site-specific phenomenon, or is it sampled over a variety of geologies? So in, in, in this case, it's it's a variety of geologies. So, I mean, we, we do not have, say, um, uh, five different permeability, stress, uh, Young's modulus relationship that all come out with the same, say, uh, 20 gigapascal Young's modulus. So we don't have that. But uh, what we see is that there's a clear trend in um, permeability versus effective stress and as a function of Young's modulus. So that, that, that is quite obvious from the literature. Might, might not be as perfect as is shown in the figure on slide 16. So this is more schematic, right? But there is a clear trend that the higher the Young's modulus, the higher the, uh, uh, the stiffness, uh, probably the higher the roughness as well, the higher maybe the larger the, 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 the grain sizes, the larger the roughness, the larger the permeability. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the the more ductile a sample is, the, the more uh, it is compressible and the more uh, we can actually close the fracture when we are increasing the stress on the fracture. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Maria Price has another question. And as I said, we're working our way through the fracture question. Um, he asks, can you recommend a different fracture perm prediction method from the usual cubic law to account for the joint roughness coefficient? There is a couple of papers that are actually really uh, looking into joint roughness coefficient and making a link to permeability. So that, that, that is available. I think it's also in one of our papers. But um, I still think that we need to understand the system a little bit better. Indeed, the, the, the only way we can really do that is to determine the roughness, which is quite an effort to begin with. 
Uh, so I haven't shown that slide, but um, Tom has spent quite a lot of time with a, a specific microscope to actually get that roughness information and then also to uh, evaluate that statistically. So that, that's not something you do in five minutes. And then, of course, you also need to do the lab testing on this sort of material, which sometimes, you know, different effective stresses. You're waiting a while. I mean, it can, can, take, can take weeks to actually get that. So we, we still need more data to actually confirm some of the, um, uh, of, the, of the knowledge that we think that we have, if you see what I mean. Yeah, thank you, thanks. I hope that answers your questions um, as well as, as the first one when you expressly, thank you for the excellent answer and great talk there. Um, we do have a question from Luis Sado <coughs> and he says, thank you for the great talk. Have you evaluated how different fracture types, both in terms of displacement, shear, opening and origin fault derived exclamation differ in terms of permeability no we, we haven't done that um there is some excellent work going on at the moment at Utrecht university in the high pressure and temperature laboratory looking at um, sharing and permeability so we cannot do that um so we, we can really only, uh, only look at the uh, changes in effective stress so that's basically opening closing sort of things but we, we cannot we cannot get uh, a sheer component in, in our experiments so in that sense um, no uh, really not uh, we, we did we did some work uh, Nathaniel uh, Fox Inskip did some work to look into uh, permeability of the same rock this is mesh point shale uh, as a function of orientation to bedding <clears throat> and even there we see that there is quite some differences but there's some differences in terms of roughness. There's some differences in terms of permeability. Obviously, right? I mean, you're, um, you, you, you have different heterogeneities depending on how you're fracturing your rock. But, but even that is still not really well understood if there's, you know, kind of a general relationship angle towards permeability or whatever. Uh, I can still see a lot of measurements being done there in the future. Yes. Thank you. Um, Continuing with another question from Luis, um, who says, also I'm wondering if you or Florian, and Florian is on the line, so you may be able to help with the chat. If you got stuck there, Andreas, if you or Florian have any insights into whether it's possible to include the effect of a fractured damage zone in a continuum model, perhaps only after analysis with a discrete fracture and matrix method. Uh, yeah, I mean, Florian, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is pretty much what we did. So we uh, uh, we, we analyzed fracture damage zones really in, in, in detail with all the statistical data. Uh, in, in the case that I showed from uh, the Monterey main fault, to get that then into MRST, which is then mapping the individual fractures and then uh, running flow models across that. So I think that that is possible. I think that has been done. Thank you. And Yuan has another question that um, around to the fracture modeling. In dealing with a fracture network, could you share your comment on the differences between the upscaling approach, the dual porosity and dual permeability model, and the discrete fracture matrix model? I'm not, not sure I get that question, or if that might be five questions in one. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I, I don't know what the differences the differences between the upscaling approach, the dual pro. So, uh, so I guess what Yuang is wondering is the, the different conceptual model to represent fractures, um, the upscaling, the dis explicit representation of the fractures using the DFM method, and then so this implicit one with a dual porosity, dual per permeability model. And maybe that's also again when Florian you can always um, draw the telephone joker, the chat joke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what, what I can say is that um, we haven't been using a dual porosity or dual permeability approach because um, we are treating Capoc uh, matrix to be too low in permeability. So if, 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 if you um, think about it again, um, matrix permeability is on the order of nano Darcy. By fracture permeability, if we get any permeability, is several orders of magnitude larger. So I think we can uh, very well ignore porosity and permeability of the matrix. <clears throat> and that makes it a much easier system to model. Uh, it's probably not the way you would go for fractured reservoir, 
that you have dual porosity to dual permeability because there the, uh, the permeabilities are much closer together. But for, for a cap walk, um, that, that, that is not needed. Thanks, Andreas. And Florian just commented here in the chat, and I think that's to, to Louis' question, and said, and we did this indeed. Um, um, we were, sorry, I'm just pulling that up here, the question, his answer, his comment, we did that indeed, but we are not able to quantify the accuracy of it. We applied the workflow and reproduced the leakage rates at Utah. So just to confirm your earlier answer to, to Louis. Um, Going back a little bit more towards the experimental side, Tim Good asks, uh, comments, Andreas, great talk. Have you ever looked at repeated cyclic loading and unloading of shales? Uh, yeah, yeah, we did um, quite, quite, a, quite a lot, actually. Um, and um, that, that's, that's, that's another crux of the entire lab testing. Um, I, I know that, for instance, in the British Geological Survey, when they are testing uh, material for radioactive waste storage, which is pretty much the same cup of material that we look at for CO2 or hydrogen or whatever storage, um, then I think they, they spend weeks in bringing the samples back to the original stress state, right? Uh, applying the stresses and then leave it there until, you know, the, the, the rock feels happily uh, it, the, the way it, it's used, it used to two kilometers at depth. Right. So, I mean, this is, this is something you can do if, if you have a lot of time. Uh, we typically uh, do that as well, but not weeks, but more days. So we see some changes in permeability. Um, if we uh, wait for a certain time, it's not orders of magnitude. It's more like a, a factor of, uh, or we need, need, need Nathaniel to confirm, but maybe it's, it's a factor of one, maybe 0 0.5 or something that we get changes in permeability, which I don't care so much about. So it's, it's probably not so much relevant if you get two or two and a half nano Darcy permeability, as long as we have nano Darcy permeability, if you see what I mean. So we see these changes. Um, uh, also, if we cycle load, but they are they are not they are not dramatic. You know, they are probably well within the overall experimental uncertainty that, that we have already. Thanks, Andreas. I don't see any the questions coming through at the moment, so um, I'm really keen to ask one final question to myself, if you allow me to. Um, and this is: what do we need to do in terms of monitoring to detect? leakage um, again so linking this back to geologic uncertainty that we actually may not <coughs> see the faults and seismic that are um, leaking at the end of the day so what how do we put this all together as a full package the modeling geologic understanding and the monitoring at the end of the day and this this has actually been one of the main um objectives of that detect project that i mentioned so we, we actually wanted to know if um, we kind of use all that information that we have in single fracture flow, uh, fracture network flow, and then you know, upscaling it to the reservoir, do we get changes in, for instance, pressure or saturation above the cap rock that are large enough that we can actually see them, these changes using uh, any kind of monitoring tool? And uh, in many of the cases, this is really uh, kind of borderline. Um, um, it, it, it might be extremely difficult to actually see and observe any kind of leakage across a fault. I mean, fault leakage is, is very localized to begin with. I mean, the fracture damage zones, they are not kilometers wide, right? I mean, if, 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 we, if we don't see them in seismic, they have a displacement of maybe maximum 10 meters that maybe gives you a, a fracture damage zone width of a meter or two, right? So they're very, very localized. Um, that means uh, we are getting relatively uh, low amounts of fluid leakage to begin with. And with these low amounts, we also don't see large pressure changes above the cap rock. Right? I mean, all, even the, the best pressure monitoring system has some thresholds in, in terms of a couple of PSI. Um, and there we, we might just not see that. Uh, we also don't see saturation changes, right? I mean, uh, but whatever is leaking is, is is very small, so you wouldn't you wouldn't see big amounts maybe by repeat seismic acquisition, for instance, uh, at, at least not not over time scales of a couple of years. Maybe if you wait hundreds of thousands of years and you see some accumulation, 
uh, below some shallower seals, you, you might be able to see that. But other than that, very, very difficult. Um, so, I mean, that, that of course will also be uh, one of the tasks in the future. I mean, if, if this is something that we cannot just accept and say, okay, uh, maybe this 0.0001% of CO2 that is leaking every year, maybe we simply accept that, that that's the case. If we don't, then probably um, there, there needs to be more monitoring uh, in, in the system to be, to be able to do that. Okay, thank you again, Andreas. Um, time is it's pretty much 4 p.m., so um, we are at the end of our webinar today. So thank you again, Andreas, for the talk. For great talk for um, taking the time to answer the excellent questions from the audience. And to the audience, thank you for participating in the many um, questions and discussions also in the, in the chat on the side. And the last word, as always, over to Martia. Yes, so thank you uh, very much, Andreas. Um, I would like to take the chance now to introduce our next week's speaker. So next week, we will host Ahmad Sami Abushaika from Hamad bin Khalifa University, who will speak about joining the Billion Cell Club, challenges, overcomes, and successes. So until next week, and as Hadi says, stay happy, healthy, and tuned in to our geoscience and geoenergy channel. So thank you, and see you next time. <laughs> See you all next week. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.